Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Sabrina Rodriguez, a reporter at The Washington Post. I am so excited to welcome you all here for today's session with former members of Congress. Um, I think we can all agree this has been an unprecedented time. So I feel there's so much that that we can tackle. Um, and, and I'm sure the audience today has plenty of the same questions that I have for you all. Um, so I really do want to jump into our panel as soon as possible. But of course, want to briefly do introductions for you all. Um, with me today, the panelists include former Congresswoman Sherry Bustos from Illinois. Uh, former Congresswoman Sherry Bustos is a partner at Mercury, co-chair of Mercury's Washington, D.C. office, and head of the firm's Illinois and Midwestern operations. And while she represented Illinois' 17th congressional district for a decade, she held numerous powerful roles in leadership, including chairing the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee. The bios for all our panelists are very lengthy, so I'm condensing them today, um, but but I'm going to jump to to the next, which former Congressman Jeff Denham. Um, Jeff Denham is a government affairs counselor in um, his firm's Washington, D.C. office, a member of the public policy and law practice group. He brings significant transportation and infrastructure policy, agriculture, natural resources, and energy experience to the firm. He was elected to the House of Representatives, where he served four terms from 2010 to 2018, representing California's 10th and formerly 19th districts. Then we have Congresswoman Stephanie Murphy, um, who is out of Florida, uh, my home state, so I have to always rep Florida. But um, former Congressman Murphy um, served on the House Ways and Means Committees, the Armed Services and Small Businesses Committees, as well as the Select Committee on the January 6th attack. And since retiring from Congress in since retiring from Congress at the beginning of 2023, she's been spending much more time with her children while still working to advance policies and causes she believes in. Then I have the former Congressman Peter Roscom. Um, as leader of Baker Hostler's federal policy team, uh, Peter Roscom leverages the knowledge that he gained during six terms as a U.S. representative from Illinois to analyze what's happening on Capitol Hill, which that's no small task, <laughs> let's be <laughs> honest, um, anticipate the potential impact um, of proposed legislation and keep clients surprised of how their businesses can be affected. So I'm going to just jump in from there. But thank you so much for, for participating in this panel, especially with the news ever moving. Um, but um, I want to start with you, former Congresswoman Bustos, and, and just how are you feeling about all the news? What is your reaction to the last few days seeing, you know, President Biden decide that he's stepping aside um, and, and no longer, you know, continuing with his reelection bid? Uh, well, first of all, uh, Sabrina, thank you for moderating this. And it's good to see um, all of my former colleagues and uh, also fellow Illinoisan here. Um, I, I'm talking with you, by the way, from Champaign, Illinois. Um, it, so in the heartland, um, I just talked to a group of soybean farmers. So I want to, and the, the reason I want to start it out by saying that is, you know, the, the politics where I come from, I come from a long line of family farmers. Um, I come from a district that is, is uh, we've got 90,000 labor households. Um, and, you know, so it's from that perspective, I was a Democrat or I am a Democrat who served in a Trump district, all right? So this, these politics are really kind of straight down the middle. So here's my, my view on it. Um, you know, President Biden, unfortunately, had a very bad performance at that debate that just was alarming to everybody. The calls were growing for him to, to not run for reelection. Um, I did not weigh in on that publicly. I figured as a former member, you know, it's not, it's not my place to weigh in on that. But you could see the momentum growing. And I think especially with uh, Speaker Emerita Pelosi um, weighing in and um, working behind the scenes to, to make sure that the Democrats in the House could hang on to their seat. And we have a we have an opportunity to win Democrats win back the majority. And I think she was looking at it through that lens. So I, I think what surprised me, Sabrina, is the pace at which he drops out um, within what, 20-ish minutes, endorses Kamala Harris, his vice president, 
And wasn't it within hours that all of a sudden we had we saw this growing support from Democrats saying that they endorse her? Um, that surprised me. I, I'm still like I'm sure all of my former colleagues were on text chains with our closest friends who are still serving. And um, I, I asked a question, is there pressure for members to endorse her this quickly? Because I thought there would be more of a process. And then I was kind of beat down uh, <laughs> going, no, there's no pressure. Who else are we going to endorse? And and I happen to have been one of those persons who thought that the James Carville suggestion of having these mini forums in the East and the South and the Midwest and the West with five top candidates and let that play out very publicly and see who rises to the top. I was a fan of that. Um, and that that has nothing that's nothing negative about Kamala Harris, but it is just like having a process where people feel like they could see this and weigh in um, and and see who wh where's the cream of the crop and then have that person take on Donald Trump in November. That would have been my choice. Again, I'm a, I'm not in House leadership, nor am I even in the House. So um, that didn't happen. But I was surprised at which the pace uh, progressed so quickly. Well, I, I'll jump in. I think Sherry makes a great point. And part of this is just the pace at which this is happening. You know, you know so the debate was June 27th and we're at today's July 24th. Think about that. So debate, Republic, or assassination attempt against Trump, Republican convention, choice of J.D. Vance, Biden drops out, Kamala steps up and so forth. So it's just a breathtaking pace and I think that both political parties have been irrationally exuberant over the past 10 days. The Republicans coming out of the GOP convention in Milwaukee felt like, hey, we have got this. It's open field running. There was just an incredible confidence that they were communicating. And I think the choice of J.D. Vance as Donald Trump's running mate is proof of that. That is that is a choice that says, I don't need to expand the base. I've got this election and I can be thinking about my, that is Trump's legacy. Um, <clears throat> I think if it were to be done today, it would have been a smarter move to pick somebody else so who can expand the map. Glenn Youngkin, Nikki Haley, you know, any, any number of these people who would, I think, have been more competitive in the fall. And then similarly, Sabrina, I think the Democrats are today irrationally exuberant. That is, all of a sudden, they feel like they've got this albatross off of them. That is, Joe Biden has stepped aside. Kamala Harris has stepped in. There's a lot of energy, a lot of fundraising, a lot of volunteers signing up. And yet, there is a whole lot of campaign that's left to go here. So I think that this is going to be a tight race. And I do think both parties have just been out of their minds with overconfidence. I, I I will say, I mean, going going off of that, it is remarkable to see the energy we've had, and it's only in a span of a couple of weeks. I keep losing track of what day it is at this point and thinking like, oh, yeah, Biden stepped aside last week and really it's been three days. Um, but but now that we've seen just what has evolved in, in the last couple of days and what you've both hit out of just how quickly they've done all of this, uh, you know, we see that that. Kamala Harris has the the number of at least pledged delegates to to secure the the nomination come the Democratic convention. How do you see the convention playing out? Will Democrats be able to rally together for the new nominee, or do you see some type of infighting plaguing the convention? Um, and I will ask you, former Congresswoman Murphy. And you know, conventions are inherently. Um, uh, orchestrated, produced um, events. And I just went to the Republican convention and it very much was um, a produced event to, to show unity, to uh, consolidate the base. I think until um, Biden made the decision to step away, people in the Democratic Party were sort of um, dreading our way towards what might have been an Irish wake instead of a convention at the DNC, right? And so what we've seen in the last couple of days since um, Biden stepped aside is a consolidation of the base, um, which had been previously a bit disaffected. The And I agree with um, Peter entirely that this race is still going to be close. 
you know, not you can't really trust any of the polling right now. But what the polling does show, I think, is the like, like typical Democratic based voters coming home. And you also saw that in the amount of money that um, Harris raised within 24, 48 hours, nearly $100 million, 60% of which came from first time individual donors. And I know that in the aftermath of the um, the Trump indictment, he raised $53 million. But what isn't said is that $50 million came from one billionaire donor. There was $3 million that came in in small dollars. So when you hear that um, Harris raised, raised $100 million in, you know, predominantly small dollar um, donations with new donors, people who hadn't previously given before. That really is a positive sign. Those are like just like little green tips, you know, um, for the Democratic Party that that there there is a shift, but it is a long road moving forward. And then I'll just agree with Sherry, too. I think the major thing that changed um, with uh, swapping, like with Biden stepping out and the Democratic Party having a new candidate was that Biden staying in and being at the top of the ticket was creating incredible headwinds for all the down ballot candidates. And it put them in a difficult situation where they were staking their credibility in order to vouch for his mental acuity when three quarters of the country had already settled that in their own mind. And I come from a state where there are a lot of seniors and it, it would have been very difficult, I think, to explain to constituents who have had to have those tough conversations with their um, elderly uh, family members where they've had to make the decision to take the keys out of their hands, basically, that no, what they were seeing isn't the same. And so really having him step aside unburdened the, the down ballot races that we're having to um, uh, you know, vouch for the president, make a decision either to vouch for the president or run from him. And so I think, um, you know, the morose kind of um, feeling that the Democrats had just three or four days ago came from the fact that it started to look like the House wasn't in play anymore. Um, but I think with this switch, that that changes the dynamics for a lot of these um, seats. And now they're they're back in play, it's competitive. And I'll say one last thing is that that's important because in the list of all that Peter mentioned that has happened over the last few weeks, um, two things that he didn't mention um, that are important. One is the immunity ruling that the Supreme Court put down that basically gives whoever is in um, uh, uh, whoever is the president, um, really, really broad um, powers that and and at the same time as giving them broad powers makes it more difficult to hold them accountable through the justice system. So in our government, the other place to hold a president accountable is in the House where impeachments originate. So it sort of and then the uh, and then we saw the some of the court cases that um the uh, former president was facing get, um, you know, delayed or tossed out as a result of this immunity case. And so it underscored for Democrats the importance of the House, um, you know, just given what how tight the White House race will be. Um, it made it uh, really starkly clear to Democrats that they had to get that the House back in play um, because that might be the uh, only check um, should the White House go to Trump um, this fall? So um, those are just some extra thoughts to add on to what my colleagues have said. One, one other point on what, what Stephanie just said, it, this, this is a quick one, but the talk in Washington all when, when President Biden was still in is that from a donor perspective and from a political gr ground game perspective, we better be all in on House Democrats because if we lose the White House, and it looks like it's going to be hard to hang on to the Senate, then the whole ball game is the House, to, to Stephanie's point. So that talk was really picking up. Now with a new uh, apparent nominee, um, it is it, there has been some settling down that, OK, we, we, we now feel like we've got a better shot at, uh, at electing a, a Democrat to be in the White House. And I would just add on to what Stephanie said, uh, both parties, uh, especially in the House, both parties have had ups and downs all year. And I think the biggest surprise on where we sit right now today 
is party unity. Um, I don't think Republicans would have ever imagined a, a couple of months ago that we would have had a, a convention uh, with this much excitement uh, and coming out of it with this much unity. I mean, you know, other than uh, New York uh, under George Bush, I mean, that was probably our biggest party unifying uh, convention. And this one, uh, having Hulk Hogan and Kid Rock and Dana White, I mean, it really felt like a lot of energy and now a, a lot of unity coming out of that. Um, and I would expect the Democrats to do the same thing. I mean, it has been very, very surprising for all of the talk over the last month on on the what ifs, um, you know, all the different uh, possible candidates, all the different changes and to unify around Kamala Harris this quickly. I've got to imagine that uh, they're going to be pulling party unity coming out of their convention as well, which is really going to change the dynamic of uh, September and October. Um and, and I would ask, I mean, now that we now that we've seen all this transpire in a matter of 72 hours and, and all the conversations that were obviously happening weeks in the lead up, I mean, how does this change the calculus for Donald Trump's campaign? You know, the, the former president had been campaigning against the current president all this time. Does does this mean some shift of messaging you expect, some shift in strategy moving forward? I would expect so. I mean, they they had it, it's clear that the Trump campaign had been anticipating and had some contingency planning, um, the speed with which they had the, the anti-Harris ads out and also some of the campaign memos that they had circulated. So the, the Trump campaign strategy now is to avoid this being a referendum on Donald Trump and making it a referendum on Kamala Harris. And that is probably they're going to focus in first on the border, where she was assigned this task of the border <clears throat> as the borders are. There's really nobody with a straight face that can say that was a success. And they're going to litigate that over and over and over again, really, really pounding that home. The second thing is <clears throat> she's got this delicate dance of having to own all of the, the, uh, the ramifications of Biden policies that have not been popular, that is, high inflation and so forth, and kind of a world on fire feeling. And she's got to own all that and at the same time communicate her own vision. And the Trump campaign is going to make it difficult for her trying to crowd that space out to say, no, 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 no. There's nothing about vision. This is all about what you're complicit with, with standing alongside of Joe Biden. And then they will also explicitly make the make the communication Kamala Harris knew about Joe Biden's health, knew about his infirmity, covered it up and so forth. And that, that so, so the Trump team is going to come out and has been coming out very, very aggressively. They don't want this to be a referendum on Donald Trump. If it's a referendum on, you know, whoever it's a referendum on loses the election. And so both sides are going to try and claim that, that high ground and press down on the other. And I agree. The, uh, they're definitely going to double down on the issues, uh, the economy. Uh, you're going to have, uh, um, the vice president defending uh, the economy right now and, and Donald Trump talking about how bad it is. Uh, the same thing on the border. I, I would say the third item that uh, I would expect uh, that is really going to get litigated heavily is going to be crime. And Kamala Harris is going to have to defend her, her record on crime as attorney general, um, defend her record uh, as it pertains to California. Um, and I would expect that, that uh, both sides are just going to go at that crime issue. She's got to defend it and they've got to attack her on it. And interestingly, just real quick, Cherry, interesting, yeah. she's got, Harris has a decent story on crime. I mean, as a prosecutor, she ran as tough on crime. The base has shifted out from underneath her on that. She's tried to get her footing again over the, the last several years. So it'll be interesting to see how nimble and able she is to talk to the, to those voters um, in the middle who are going to be making those decisions. Sherry, sorry. Well, again, no, that was exactly my point. She's a prosecutor. That is her entire professional background, right? She was a prosecutor at the um, at a, a, a county level. She was a prosecutor at a statewide in the largest state in the country. Um, and that is her background. And she is, as their campaign in the early days are pointing out in her initial speech, she's running against a guy who has faced numerous indictments, who has lost in civil court, um, who who has a pretty bad track record as it pertains to um, ripping off people that he uh, did business with um, in the business world when he was a developer. 
Um, you know, so she's, I, I think she's a person who is well suited to run against a guy like Donald Trump. But to bring it back to your early question, yeah, the, the Trump campaign has to shift gears. Uh, Susie Wiles, with whom I work, by the way, she's in the in Mercury, the, the firm I work with, but she's also his um, closest, one of his closest advisors, said that B Joe Biden was a gift. Um, you know, they were looking forward to running against him. Well, now they've got a, it is a total shift. Um, and, you know, Dem Stephanie and I could write the script as Democrats, exactly what the Republicans are going after her on. You know, we knew they would be calling her the, the border czar uh, because they see that as an issue. Keep in mind that the number of border crossings are are, are way down under this new decision from the Biden Harris uh, camp. Um, so uh, we could, you know, now they're calling her a DEI candidate. Um, I think they should be very, very careful, very careful about how they are, um, how they are talking about her. She's an accomplished person with an accomplished background. And to call her a DEI candidate is very offensive to a lot of people. Stephanie, I see you nodding to to what Sherry was saying. Do you have anything to? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I just have to say when I heard the DEI candidate thing uh, from one of my former colleagues, I thought to myself, huh, I wonder if he looks at me that way, right? I'm a woman. I'm a person of color. Did I just get to Congress and my career with all of my hard work that way? It feels very personal to people who have worked hard in this country and have achieved things to hear other people, who, you know, assess people who look like them in that manner, right? And so that they really risk alienating a lot of people that they really need. Um, and then just to the border thing, I think the Harris campaign, well, Dems are really hor really horrible on messaging regarding the border. But what, what she really needs to do is to point out that the Republicans, you know, a great place to start on the border would have been that border, that bipartisan border bill that would have passed had Trump not stepped in and told all of the Republican Party to play politics with it. So if we have a problem with the border, which we have had for decades now, the border has been an issue. And, you know, whether you want to go back to the Gang of Eight who tried to solve it, it it's just been an issue that both parties own some level of complicity in not addressing. But most recently in this Congress, there was an opportunity to address the issue um, and they chose to play politics with it. And this week we're watching the House floor once again be used for campaigning. This this um, resolution that they're putting up um, condemning Harris for you know the border. And, and that's campaigning on the House floor. Um, essentially, you know, and it's going to be a partisan vote, but it's not going to make anybody safer or our border any more secure. And so she has to really be able to like turn turn this um, and and, you know, put it back on them um, because this not one party owns the mess that is going on at the border. And th the other thing I will say, too, is that when it comes to the border, doing things by executive order, which is is, is not a sustainable um, approach. You have to have Congress involved and you can't have Congress involved if they continue to use it as a political football. Um, so I, I do think she needs to do that. I, I did listen to her speech this week and I thought she did a really good job. One, she kept it brief. It was like 15 minutes, five of which were thank yous to the people in the crowd, shout outs to them. But her message was really easy to take walk away with. She talked about who she's fighting for. She did do a little bit of the um, base talk about, you know, Trump, but she said, but you know, this, this election isn't about him. It's about who we're fighting for. And she talked about who we're fighting for. And she's talking about middle America, you know, middle-class Americans. And what are we fighting for? Freedom, opportunity, and the rule of law. And then she went on to say, how are we going to do this? I need you all to go out there and knock doors and make phone calls. And then that was the end of the speech. So for the Democratic Party, they've got their marching orders. We're fighting for the middle class. We're fighting for freedom, opportunity, and the rule of law. And we do it by organizing and um, campaigning from now until November. Um, that is a much simpler, I mean, if you had asked me what Biden's message was, you know, over the last year and a half or two years, I, I couldn't have told you that. And so already we're seeing um, some significant improvements in the, the campaign approach. 
Um, and I hope to see that, you know, let's see how they apply that to stickier issues like the border. I think that they, the campaign that is able to cast that forward-looking vision that Stephanie was talking about will be the winning campaign. Donald Trump has this tendency to look in the rearview mirror and want to litigate things in the past. And it just doesn't strike me that there's much percentage in that. And so to the extent that Harris is able to do that, that will be an advantage to her. And particularly if that's her natural inclination. I will say, though, I do think it's very difficult for her to get out of this border question. And it's kind of the political equivalent of a neck tattoo at this point. I think it's just on her. And <clears throat> arguing process, in my experiencing, process arguments are losing arguments. You know, um, Senate Republicans did this. They wouldn't let our bill move here. I just don't think that's really persuasive. And the, the fact of the matter, I think that most voters say, I don't know, I may not like Donald Trump's rhetoric or his tweets, but this wasn't happening when he was president and it's happening now. And um, the and, and and there's an irony, too, in that Biden was arguing in the alternative, first saying, I need this legislation. And then after the legislation didn't pass, moving ahead, saying, well, I don't need it. And so I think when it all nets out, <clears throat> it's going to be really, really tough for Harris to to easily answer the, the border question. I think she's got to sort of tap to it and then turn and shift and talk about other things. That is, what should the future look like or what would I do if I'm unbridled by other things? But I think the border, um, we've all seen that interview where she was challenged about whether she went to the border. I think it was Lester Holt, but it was, you know, you're almost uncomfortable for her when she's sitting for this interview and it's so awkward and just so off-putting. And I think we're gonna see literally millions of dollars put behind that ad. But Peter, to your to your point, Stephanie laid out what what Kamala Harris had talked about in that opening speech and laid out the vision for the future. To your point, the winner will be the the candidate who is looking to the future. You've got Donald Trump still talking about this weird Hannibal Lecter thing that I have no idea what he's referring to. Um, I, I think mean, he's confusing uh, asylum with asylum, like asylum I, immigration asylum versus asylum like how, where and Hannibal Lecter. How bizarre is that? <laughs> How bizarre is that? It's just bizarre. And then you've got J.D. Vance talking about childless cat ladies. I mean, that is not a vision for the future. Um, and I think right now, obviously, you know, when something's new, there's always a level of excitement. The crowds are very excited right now. Democrats, um, even like I said, I don't I didn't like the process. It was way too fast. I wish there had not. I wish there had been more of a process. But we but we know it's going to be Kamala Harris now. And there is a certain level of excitement. To, you know, 60 percent of new donors over the, that time are brand new to the process. That's pretty darn good. And if, if this message can continue about the future and, it, you know, the, the rule of law is, is a very good argument. Freedom is a very good argument, because when you've got the overturning of Roe versus Wade and um, the Republicans thinking that they, especially the males, thinking they can make decisions for women, and what we do with our health care, that that is that that's a losing argument for the Republicans. And it is a huge winner for Democrats. So, look, I, I think if we get this right and, and Democrats can screw things up, um, especially, you know, the, those of us who come from downstate Illinois or a, a district like Stephanie represented, we know that they can screw things up. But right now we've got we're in a really good place if we can continue with this positive, forward looking message as opposed to this talk about Hannibal Lecter and childless cat ladies. It is it is a bizarre um, contrast that we can that we can address in a very positive way right now. As and I think that, to your point, Sherry, I think what in, in another way of saying what you're saying is the campaign that can answer uh, the question that voters have, that is, what's in it for me? Why do I care? That is the campaign that if they can land that question, that's the, that will be the winning campaign this fall. Well, and I think that there are two things to look at coming up to the Democratic convention. Uh, first is who is the, the VP uh, the VP pick and does that actually help uh, improve the numbers? And then secondly, the battleground states, uh, Republicans have a huge advantage in today. Can Democrats close that gap with party unity coming out with a strong message in the uh, Democrat convention? And are we coming out of August uh, going into September when 
both houses come back to do their final work, uh, are, are, is that gap closed? And are those battleground states really competitive? I think the Democrats, too, have a big advantage right now in early voting. Um, for years, Donald Trump was dumping all over this notion of early voting and, you know, only pushing people to same day voting. He's apparently had a road to Damascus experience. And now all of a sudden is like, hey, get everybody early vote. But the mechanism, you know, Sherry, you know, running the DCCC, the mech creating these mechanisms, it's a lot of work and it's not it's it's not an easy thing. So I think the GOP has some catching up to do in terms of early voting. Here, it is funny that you mentioned that because I was just, I literally took photos of this two days ago. I was at a J.D. Vance rally in Radford, Virginia, his first day officially on the solo on the campaign trail. Um, and there were signs that they were giving out that said vote early. <laughs> like there you they, go. In the crowd, it was like the Trump Vance 2024 signs. And then there was signs for vote early. And there was a table that was set up specifically to give people the dates to explain to them mail in voting, explain to them voting early and like really driving home that point. Um, but with that, I'll kind of shift over then to, to everything that we've seen happening on the Republican side. This feels like it was a long time ago now, but this was just, you know, two weeks ago, um, we saw the attempt on on President Trump's life and and seeing that assassination attempt and everything that has unfolded in the conversations around the Secret Service and what security looked like. But but how has has that changed anything in this race, do you feel? Um, and, and I always feel sensitive even talking about it in that way, because obviously that it was a terrible situation for the country to face and for Trump to face, but but has that assassination attempt affected Republican voters, swing voters, anything on the contours of this race? I think it, it's definitely, uh, it, it's changed the image with a lot of swing voters. Uh, it's certainly propelled the party unity uh, going into our convention. I, I would say, um, you know, also at the same time, it uh, is doesn't feel like it's been as lasting of an issue uh, since the news cycle is changing so quickly. I mean, you had uh, first uh, Vice President Kamala Harris uh, come in and, and well, Joe Biden make the announcement, Kamala Harris uh, uh, picking up all, all of the support, um, you know, with Republicans actually bipartisan um, going after the uh, director of Se uh, Secret Service, um, very bipartisan but having her step down quickly, uh, I think, again, is it's changing the messaging very, very quickly, where this should have been something uh, similar to when Ronald Reagan got shot, um, something that people remember for, for months and months and years and years. Um, not to say people aren't going to remember, but the news cycle is changing much quicker than anybody would have ever, ever anticipated. I think Donald Trump's speech um, was interesting, his his acceptance speech. My <laughs> my advice to him, not that he's soliciting my advice, but my advice to him would have been, you know, to give that sort of reflective tone for the first 20 minutes that he did, which I think was very, very compelling. And um, it was, was easy to listen to. It was um, easy to empathize with him. And then 10, you know, use the last 10 minutes to draw a contrast in terms of these, these issues. But you can see, and, and I think that would have served him really, really well. And for him then to continue to be this, uh, what, what he said or what the campaign said was, I, we're going to be a unifying candidacy and so forth. I think that going on for that extra hour was not helpful. And I think that um, his demeanor moving forward, he has a real opportunity that hasn't yet been squandered, but to but to create more and more goodwill coming out of an, uh, uh, such a terrifying event like that, where people are naturally sympathetic. You know what I mean? It does. You can be somebody's biggest opponent in the world, but you wouldn't wish that on them. And um, and I think he would be wise to really, really. Uh, be gracious in how he's communicating right now. And whether he's got that cap capacity is anybody's guess. And I'll ask, I mean, after that, we we had the Republican National Convention. There's no question to, to see the energy that the base, that the delegates there 
felt and and I have like permanently engraved in my mind from all these rallies everyone like yelling fight 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 that has become sort of like the anthem in the last couple of weeks but but among the news of of the Republican National Convention was of course Trump naming Senator JD Vance to be his vice presidential pick to be his running mate um how how do you view that decision do you see J.D. Vance drawing in new voters or is this such a conservative ticket that it could put off uh, moderate voters? I think a lot of it's going to have to do with messaging. Uh, most of the country does not know J.D. Vance, and this is the opportunity to to, to get to know him. Uh, certainly uh, more people are, are reading his book and, and seeing uh, his movie, uh, which I think really humanizes him. I mean, he's got a tremendous American story, uh, but... It, it's all getting to know him and how it fits uh, It fits with the ticket, especially coming from Ohio. It's not necessarily somewhere that uh, President Trump's going to get a big bump from. Sabrina, I don't want to parse in terms of characterization, but I would describe J.D. Vance as more of a populist and less of a conservative. Um, and that, that could be a subject for, uh, you know, weekend seminars, but we don't have time for that. I think that it was a pick that demonstrated a level of confidence that Donald Trump has in the outcome of this election that that is pretty breathtaking. Um, and I think it was an opportunity that was lost to reach out to other kinds of voters. You know, so the the type of person that's going to vote for uh, Donald Trump and J.D. Vance, it's the same person. Um, you can imagine somebody uh, who says, I'm not really wild about Donald Trump, but I really like Glenn Youngkin, or I really like Nikki Haley, or I really like Marco Rubio being a value add proposition. And I also think it's interesting, <clears throat> in my opinion, in looking at the numbers from 2022, Vance underperformed in Ohio. I mean, his Republican governor, Mike DeWine, <clears throat> crushed it in terms of a big, big election result. And I don't know the delta off the top of my head, but I think that, you know, Vance ended up winning. It was only after Mitch McConnell's super PAC poured millions of dollars in to pull him, you know, to pull him across uh, for the win. So I don't see I, I see Vance as a legacy pick for Donald Trump. I don't see him as somebody who expands a map or um, or finds new voters. One, one thing I will note just on this populist thing that Peter mentioned and that I, um, when I was at the Republican convention that really struck me, um, it was not the party of Reagan conservatives um, at all. They had a union leader, uh, O'Brien on the stage. They had people calling corporations um, economic terrorists. They had messaging that if, you're uh, uh, what people used to call chamber Republican, somebody who believed in small government, big, you know, business, uh, pro-growth um, policies. You might have felt a little bit like um, alone in the um, Republican convention because the messaging coming from that stage wasn't um, wasn't familiar at all uh, relative to like previous conventions. And you didn't see, you know, some of those, uh, the Republic Republicans that, that probably supported Nikki Haley, you know, a, a strong foreign policy, pro-business, small government kind of Republican. And so, you know, I, I think, um, I think in the fervor of supporting your various candidates, it's easy to kind of set some of those concerns aside just so that your party wins. But should the party win, I think there are going to be a lot of businesses and otherwise who are like, wait a second, is, did, <laughs> did I just vote for like anti-trade, like, um, you know, uh, going after, I think J.D. Vance thinks that uh, Lena Khan has done a great job with all of her antitrust work. I mean, so you're seeing in American politics sort of a, a horseshoeing of the mm -hmm. left, the far left and the far right on some of these very populist um, policies that could have a significant impact on our relationship with our allies and um, our adversaries, with our trading partners and on the world more broadly. Um, and uh, right now, those issues haven't been picked apart a little bit or, or really um, highlighted because the party unity is sort of keeping them under the under the um, the cover, like the top cover of what's being talked about. 
I, I think JD I think JD Vance is a gift to Democrat. I mean, look, he's boring. He, you know, is throwing out this childless cat lady accusation, which is just bizarre. He's telling jokes about drinking Mountain Dew that he for some reason thinks that Democrats are going to call racist. I mean, bizarre. But more importantly, his views on, again, women's health. I, you know, women don't need to be told what to do and what not to do on their own health care. He has this 1950s view that he wants women to go back to. You know, he's talking about women staying in in relationships where there's abuse for, for the good of the child. Um, he's talking about, you know, this this anti uh, choice that is just to the extremes. Um, you, you know, Republicans want to win back suburban women with this guy. Um, I, I don't know why anybody would give him a second look. Um, he does not expand that base at all. It, with Kamala Harris's choice of VP, my hope is that she will take a look at where she needs to expand um, the voter base, and we'll pick someone that will uh, that will maybe address the, the the concerns that people have about the border. Mark Kelly might be a good choice along those lines. Um, that will uh, will be something that she's not. That will expand the 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 base to to get more Demo votes for her uh, for to, for her to become president. Well, we're at that point that I want to remind everyone in the audience to please submit questions um, and, and make sure to use the Q&A function um, that the Zoom webinar offers us. Um, but but I want to ask one more question then before we turn to that Q&A. And it's just, how does this impact all the many other elections that are happening across the country? Of course, we, we focus so heavily on the presidential race, but but I think the four of you know more than anyone just the impact that all of this can have on down ballot elections. Um, so how are you looking at this presidential race impacting that for both parties? I think it's indisputable, indisputable that uh, Republicans have a huge advantage in the Senate. I mean, the map just lays it out that way uh, this year. Um, We've had opportunities in the past that we have uh, have not gained uh, in the Senate, uh, but right now the map just lines up for us. The House, I think, uh, again, you know, both parties have had their ups and downs in the House this year, but I would say uh, from a House perspective, I believe the House is going to go the way of the presidency. Um, a Trump presidency probably means that Republicans hold on with a slim majority, um, and if uh, Kamala Harris wins, uh, the, I think the Democrats will have a lot more opportunities, especially in those battleground states where um, they might not normally pick up seats. I'd keep an eye on, <clears throat> for Republicans, I would keep an eye on California <clears throat> and New York. If the California Republicans and the New York Republicans are able to, to hold on, then I think it's more likely not than not the, the GOP comes back in a majority. What What's going to be interesting is if if it collapses underneath them, if suburban New York says, forget it, we're we're out, we're going with Harris or, you know, these competitive California seats say we're going with Harris, then I think it's likely to be uh, to be a switch. So the irony is looking at, at states that are not Republican strongholds are actually going to be the states that I think are dispositive in terms of whether there's uh, a GOP majority and the challenge with American politics is politics is a team sport, but you don't get to pick your team. So you are influenced by every kind of comment that somebody else makes that all of a sudden, you know, one of your colleagues tweets something and it's <clears throat> some outrageous thing. And then you're asked, well, what do you think of that? And it's like, oh, gee whiz, man, are you kidding me? Um, I've got to comment and critique on every ridiculous thing that comes out of the mouth of one of these people who's who's in my party. And therein lies, it happens on both sides, but therein lies a real challenge. These races now become nationalized. Yeah, I, I, I would agree with that. Everything becomes nationalized um, when the, the presidential race is on, is on the ballot. And um, when you have a D by your name, um, and you're in a swing district, um, you are, you're lined up with whoever is at the top of the ticket. Um, Stephanie knows this uh, as, as well as I do. The attack ads that we endured were typically, they would tie us to Nancy Pelosi. That was the the, the big attack on those of us who were in, in swing districts. And, you know, it, it didn't even matter if we had a pretty good voting record 
uh, that that showed some independence and showed that we were reflecting our district. Um, same thing with, you know, when the phrase defund the police, when that came out, that got attacked on to every Democrat. Now, keep, keep in mind, Sabrina, I'm married to I was uh, I married to a guy who was the the sheriff of our county. And yet my opponent was saying I was for defunding police and and, uh, you know, because that phrase was out there. So they, these become nationalized. And so who is at the top of the ticket matters a lot. Um, the concern that Nancy Pelosi had when she was um, behind the scenes working to have President Biden um, get out of the uh, process to be the Democratic nominee. Um, again, it was through that lens of how are my House Democrats going to do? Are we going to be able to hang on to those in the toughest districts? And are we going to be able to pick up Democrats in the toughest districts? And that was through that lens. And that is why she was pushing for a change at the top of the ticket. And I'm going to turn now then to the Q&A. Um, our, one of the first questions we, we've we received is asking, do you think we will see another presidential debate? And what about a vice presidential debate? Um, how, how would these debates impact voters? I mean, we clearly saw the impact of the first debate between Joe Biden and Donald Trump, but but casting it forward, can we even expect to, to see more debates? Well, you certainly can't go by what uh, Donald Trump is saying. One day he's saying he's not going to debate. The next day he's saying he is. Who knows with with a guy like you just do not know, um, you know, what what he says is truthful for that day or the next week or the next month. I hope we do. Um, I hope we do for the presidential and the vice presidential, um, because I, I think that a, a good debater could, could shred Donald Trump and, and go in and know what he's talking about and whether it's truthful or not. Um, I, I, so I hope that we see that. And I, I hope we do whoever the vice presidential nominee is for the Democrats. Um, I, I hope we'll see that against J.D. Vance. I think there's a lot to work with on going after the other side and to the earlier point where we can paint this vision for a better future for, for our children, our grandchildren, for our country. I think Donald Trump has a political cunning that is really quite amazing. So that when when Joe Biden laid out the parameters for a debate, that is, he wanted CNN to do it. He didn't want an audience. He wanted the microphones blocked. Trump said, yes, yes, yes. You know what I mean? And he knew how that was what 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 that was going to go to directionally. And I think Trump and his campaign are going to be making a decision at, at the time and it'll either put pressure on Harris to debate, or he will say she's not worthy of debating. You know what I mean? And and it, it's it's all about the politics. Would it be good to have debates? Absolutely. I mean, I think they're, I mean, the five of us would all be watching. We can't get enough of this stuff. Um, but in the same way, I do think, to Sherry's point, it helps to inform a lot of folks. It helps them to get a feel for who these people are, what the pressure is like, how they respond to you know, adverse questions and so forth. And um, I think the the country, just looking at the debates from last time, you know, in the last cycle, the, the first debate was just awful. And then the second debate was pretty interesting between Biden and Trump. And, um, and you know, hopefully we could have a debate where you're actually able to finish some thoughts and finish some sentences and, and present yourself to the public. But I think, I think, Trump and his campaign is going to be very calculating and trying to keep Harris and her campaign off balance for as long as possible. Yeah, I think calculating is a good word there. Um, certainly, uh, Republicans expect another debate. Uh, I would say that the, the Trump team uh, is excited about another debate. But calculating is, I, I think, what uh, Republicans especially are going to be looking at, uh, what happens with the convention, what happens with the VP pick, um, and certainly there's going to be some negotiating that goes on to, to change what uh, the parameters of the next debate are or next debates, um, questioning whether or not they'll have multiple debates and, and, you know, a VP debate once there's a VP pick. So I would expect confidently that there will be debates, but probably not announced until uh, the VP pick and, and the Democrat convention uh, uh, preclude. I'm going to turn to the next question. Um, and once someone in the audience is asking, how will Biden's withdrawal from the 2024 election impact the rest of his presidential term? And 
given this change in nominee, how could this impact House Republicans' agenda and just leadership on the Hill this fall? Well, he's he's going to complete his term despite um, some of these just odd uh, calls for him to um, get out of the presidency. Um, yeah, I look. It's it, anytime you're this close to an election, there's not a whole lot that happens legislatively. Um, we have the appropriations process that's still way be, it's behind schedule. You have things I told you earlier. I was talking to the Soybean Association. You know, we don't have a farm bill even that. So that's more that's going on more than a year behind schedule. There's a lot that needs to happen legislatively, but my guess is it most of that will happen in the lame duck session. So after the um, election and then before the next Congress is sworn in and the and the inauguration. I mean, I th th that's fairly typical in an election year in Washington D.C. All of August, um, you've got your every House member and senator are back in their home states and their home districts. So there's nothing done then. Um, you know, so I, but, but Biden will complete his term and um, will, and, and obviously will have a heightened awareness about his legacy because this is it for a, a political career that has, has started with him being a U.S. Senator as the, at the time, the youngest U.S. Senator in the nation. And, um, you know, we'll complete now that he's um, in his early eighties and will be leaving his political career behind him. So he'll, he'll be thinking increasingly about his legacy. I agree with Sherry. I, I do think the president will complete his term, um, but I think that uh, his health will be the question um, unless he comes out and says something or does something where it looks like he's uh, uh, not fit to serve. Um, I, I'm confident he's going to finish his term. Now, that does not mean that Republicans won't fall for the bait and continue to attack it. It becomes a sidebar because it becomes irrelevant at this point on the presidential contest itself. But that does not mean Republicans won't take the bait and eat up a lot of time in September, which I think would actually take us in the wrong direction as uh, as a mess as messaging for the party. And I mean, we probably only have time for a couple more questions, but but another one that was asked here was, do you think that Senator Vance was chosen as a quote, you know, force multiplier in the Rust Belt states and and given that, and, and if you agree with that, do you think Democrats would try to counter that with their own VP choice? I think it was actually a pick by the president, um, pick based on uh, the ability to work together. Um, and, you know, Trump as a negotiator, is, is it somebody that he could work with uh, from a long term basis? I'm not sure that there was a, a calculus. If there was a calculus on does it help me as a state or does it uh, help me to have uh a person of color or a woman, I, I think that it was it was more about who does the president work with the best, which is a different way than um, previous presidents have looked at it. Yeah, I'm not so sure it's necessarily a force multiplier. I think it's um, it's a legacy pick, and it is about Trump securing his vision for for you know a couple of terms in his in his mind, a couple of terms past his uh, past his next term. And as far as uh, Kamala Harris's pick as as VP, um, look, JD Vance is he's easy to go after. Uh, again, he's got views that are out of sync with um, I'm I'm going to say especially women. Um, and so I I my hope for Kamala Harris's VP pick is somebody who will complement her, not duplicate her. We don't need. You know, we need somebody who can bring in new voters. Um, I think it should be somebody from a swing state because to the point that was made earlier, these seven swing states are going to be critical to the outcome of this presidential election. And if we can get any kind of edge, whether it's from Arizona or Pennsylvania, um, it, it, that's really going to be important because in the end, um, you know, I'm, I'm from a, a Illinois, or a, a blue state. Il Illinois is not going to matter that much. Um, but but these 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 states that are swing states, those are going to be critical to the ultimate winner in November. So I, if, if I were if I were Kamala Harris, I would keep that in mind. And, you know, how does the electoral politics play into this? Um, and, and, you know, in the end, if, if she's elected, you do want somebody who you can work with and who can help you be have the best administration possible. 
Sherry, I have to laugh because I looked down at my phone to check the time. And the first thing that came up was an email right now from Harris for president saying J.D. Vance, uh, um, J.D. Vance makes history as the least popular V pick of all time. So yeah, they're weak. definitely messaging around that. <laughs> he's weak. And I didn't even get those talking points from anybody. I just, you know, I'm just watching him and looking at his politics and they're wrong. Um, and uh, and I think he's going to be a hindrance to Donald Trump. He doesn't add anything. And, um, you know, if, if Kamala Harris makes a, a great decision on this, um, it could it, that can be, uh, you know, the, the different the, it's going to be a very slim difference um, here in this vote in those seven states. And, you know, the states that we can pick up and hang on to as Democrats, those are just going to be critical. Yeah. And I, I want to close out with sort of just one overarching question. I mean, being on the road and going to battleground states and talking to voters, I mean, something that I, I, I hear often is people that are not planning to vote, that are saying, this is all a mess. I, I, I don't know what to do. And therefore, I'm not going to participate in the system. And I mean, we hear plenty about non-voters in other election cycles, but I feel like it is definitely something that has come up in this one. What would you say to someone who is not planning to vote in this year's elections? It's real easy. I would say rub some dirt on it. Don't be a, a self-absorbed, uh, completely ridiculous fool. It is ridiculous to step back from the privilege of voting. And then at the same time to complain about what's going on, it's obtuse. So people have fought and died for the freedom that we have to rigorously debate in this country and to, to say, I'm too busy or I'm too cynical or I don't care <clears throat> is the ultimate black hole of self-absorption. Ditto, other than using the word obtuse, which nobody I hang out with says that other than Members, former members of Congress, <laughs> but no, uh, you know, look, uh, I I was talking to somebody who was making phone calls, um, and this was still when it was you know uh, President Biden running against President Trump, and he said he he would tell the the people he was calling, he said this is a three way race, it's President Biden, it's former President Trump, and it's the couch, and that is what we are fighting, um, and now there's like this new level of enthusiasm. Um, and you still got it. And now the eight, the whole age issue is flipped on its head. Donald Trump's the old man. Donald Trump's the guy who's, um, you know, seems to have some kind of health issues. Um, he's the guy who's got these weird um, memory and, and, and brain blips where he's talking about weird things and goes on tangents. That's the guy we can point to who's got the issue. Um, and so uh, so I, I hope that there's this new energy a new level of excitement, and we can hang on to that for these next hundred plus days. Um, and in the end, you know, we've got hopefully the first, uh, I, you know, I was going to say the first female president, but I'm going to take that back because I think the other thing that will be very important when you look at President Obama and how he ran his campaign, even as the first black president in the history of our nation, he didn't make it about that. Um, and I think that will be very, very important that it's not viewed as, um, you know, I'm the first anything, but that it's viewed as this is about the future of our country, the vision for this country, what we're going to do, um, the importance of the American dream and feeling that that's still something that is really, really important in a country like ours. And I, I hope I hope I hope the word first and I wanted to take that back. I hope that's not even part of this dialogue, because I, I don't think that's. Um, I don't think that's something that excites a lot of that, that it's actually a deterrent in, in some cases. So let's talk about the future of this country and why Democrats are the best to help execute on that. On I think that there's, there's, there's too much at stake in this election um, and polarization is at an all time high. I mean, Republican intensity is, is up. I expect the Democrat intensity to be up. And I think on both sides of the aisle, you're going to have Republicans that show up to vote against Kamala Harris, just as you have Democrats, the high intensity uh, to vote against Trump. So this should be the highest uh, voter turnout that we've ever seen. I think the uh, independents or the swing voters um, are going to have many reasons to, to come out and, and to vote. And uh, I mean, let's wait and see what comes out of the Democrat convention. But I expect, expect to see high intensity um high party unity from both parties and a very, very high turnout come November. 
Well, we've hit that 11 o'clock hour, and I'm sure everyone has plenty going on, given all the news that we just discussed. Um, but but I wanted to thank so much our panelists, Peter, Sherry, Stephanie, Jeff. I, I really appreciate you taking the time for this audience and honestly for my own personal engagement on these issues. Um, so, so thank you so much. And to the audience that took the time to tune in, um, thanks so much. And I'm sure between now and November, we will probably doing another one of these. <laughs> Have so, a good one. Thank, thank you, you all. Thanks, everybody. Bye -bye. Good to see y'all.